Hello and welcome to the ninth podcast in humanities and Western civilization. We are actually getting closer to the end of the term right now and things are getting exciting. In this podcast, we're going to see Europe completely transform itself from the scientific revolution through to the enlightenment and then the blood, guts and gore of the French revolution. You see an image in front of you here of the beheading of Louis XVI. Uh, there's lots of exciting things to talk about, so buckle in and let's get started. The learning outcomes for this unit are, number one, explain the idea and application of absolute monarchy. These are powerful kings, kings that emerged during the early modern period. They are the very definition of a top of a pyramid type of king, something that did not exist in the Middle Ages. We saw that kings were weak then, now they become powerful. Number two, explain the development of constitutional government in England. England will go a very different path from France. We're going to be contrasting those two different countries. In France, kings become super powerful, whereas in England, they don't. And so we're going to look at why that was the case. Number three, explain the development of the scientific revolution and its impact on the European intellectual tradition. Number four, recognize the basic characteristics of the Enlightenment. Number five, determine the causes and results of the French Revolution. And number six, assess the impact of Napoleon on France and on Europe. Okay, so just a reminder from our medieval unit. When we talked about kings, you probably, when you know you first have studied the Middle Ages, maybe in high school, you might have seen a diagram like this with a king at the top, and we talked about how that is a myth, that the traditional view of medieval society with kings at the top of a pyramid is, is just not true. Medieval kings were in fact weak during the Middle Ages. Generally speaking, they didn't have much power. They had to rely on powerful noble families in order to get anything done. However, once we get into the early modern period, things are very, very different. We finally do see kings which are at the top of a pyramid. Absolutism is what we call uh, where the monarch rules with absolute power, absolute sovereign power over the state, meaning the buck stops with the king. The king gets to decide what the law is and everybody else has to fall in line. And so during the uh, 16th and 17th century, we start to see these types of kings emerge, particularly in France. And it really is a pyramid with the king on top, the nobles in the middle and the peasants down at the bottom. These type of kings, absolute monarchs, are different from constitutional monarchy, which is what we'll see emerge in England. And a constitutional monarchy is where the monarch is constrained by law and by a constitution, where they're only allowed to do certain things. Absolute monarchs are also associated with this concept that only God can appoint them, that they are second only to God, and that they rule by divine right. So often we see early modern kings who are absolute rulers very closely um, entwining themselves to the religion of the state and their rule. The idea being that um, they are the representatives of both God and of the state at the same time. This is the divine right of kings. No king in the early modern period epitomizes absolutism more than Louis XIV. Louis XIV was king of France and he was known as the Sun King because all power emanates from the sun. Uh, he had um, uh, come into his reign when he was just a child and through the help of, of two very able-bodied ministers, uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Richelieu and Cardinal Mazarin, uh, he was able to consolidate all power in himself. One of the ways he was able to do this was by bypassing the old noble families. And he did this in a number of ways, but and we talked about this in previous units, how kings were turning old feudal relationships, which used to be based on service, into monetary payments. With that money, uh, kings were able to create their own bureaucracies, which were loyal to them. And kings also began to promote and uh, elevate into a noble status these new wealthy merchant families. These merchant families who had become very wealthy, in some cases more wealthy than uh, the traditional old noble families, but they lacked one thing, they lacked having a noble name. Well, people like Louis XIV were able to give them that 
uh, that noble name. And as a result, they owed everything to the king. And this created a new nobility that was loyal only to the king, bypassing the old nobility. And it's under this circumstance that we start to see truly powerful kings like Louis XIV. One of the best ways of looking at Louis XIV and understanding just how powerful he was is to look at his palace of Versailles. So Versailles was built during his reign. And if you've ever been to France, it's well worth a day trip outside of Paris to see it. First of all, it's a sprawling complex. It's absolutely humongous and it is just gorgeous everywhere you go. So the story goes that Louis wanted a new palace. He didn't like his dingy old medieval castle palace that was in Paris, and he wanted something a little bit nicer that was closer to his hunting grounds. Uh, so he said, I'd like to have a palace built right there. The problem was, is that it was a swamp. And his ministers advised him saying, sire, you can't build a palace there. It's, it's terrible land. It's, it, we can't build it there. Louis XIV was an absolute ruler. And what Louis wants, Louis gets. And so at incredible expense, requiring some of the best architectural minds and engineers of the day, they achieved the seemingly impossible and built this massive complex in a swamp. And there is no greater testament to Louis's power than the very existence of Versailles. Here you see the famous Hall of Mirrors inside Versailles. Just another example, just the incredible lavish and ornate display of wealth and power uh, that was embedded into every part of the Palace of Versailles. So if kings got really powerful in France, a very different process was happening in England, where kings were constrained by law and custom. So the biggest reason why kings in England had a harder time imposing absolute rule dates back to the Middle Ages, to an event that resulted in the creation of Magna Carta. So Magna Carta translates from Latin into the Great Charter. And for many people, it is an incredibly important document. Uh, some would argue that it is the foundation, in fact, of Western democracy. But what it really was, was a struggle between the nobles of England and the king of England. So there was a rebellion of nobles against King John. And King John lost the rebellion. And in 1215, he was forced to sign this humiliating document, and it severely limited what kings in England were allowed to do after that. Uh, first of all, um, they weren't allowed to just simply throw people in prison, that kings had to follow the law just like everyone else. And in fact, justice was universal, so everyone was entitled to justice. Um, in fact, uh, when uh, lawyers in court cases today make a plea of habeas corpus, that means literally show me the body, that is essentially um, dating back to a right that was enshrined in Magna Carta, meaning that you can't just falsely imprison someone, that you actually have to um, provide um, you know, uh, a course of justice for that person. Also, and this was very important, kings weren't allowed to simply impose taxes at will whenever they wanted to. And in fact, they had to ask permission of a council of the top nobles, a baron's council, which would later be known as parliament, for permission to raise taxes. So this really meant that there was a partnership in England between parliament and the king. And that just does not exist in France. And this would severely limit future English kings' ability to do things completely uh, unilaterally. So this isn't to say that there weren't English kings that uh, didn't try to exert power like an absolute ruler. Charles I um, is a king that certainly gave it a good go. Uh, Charles I was king roughly during the same time that kings in France were becoming very, very powerful. So he's contemporaneous with that process in France. And he certainly wanted to emulate that process in England. He saw himself as a king who had been anointed by God. And he really, really didn't like that he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. In particular, he hated Parliament. He hated having to go cap in hand to Parliament every single time he wanted to raise some money for one venture or another venture. So generally speaking, he didn't. Instead, he borrowed money 
he borrowed lots and lots and lots of money mostly from the nobles of the kingdom and if a noble didn't lend him money well then they might find themselves imprisoned that was one of his tactics now of course that goes directly against the magna carta um so uh generally speaking charles was not very well liked amongst uh many of the nobles in the kingdom and things were quite tense in england during much of his reign at a certain point charles had just had enough of dealing with parliament altogether and in 1629 he simply suspended it and there would not be another sitting of parliament for 11 long years and during that time you can just imagine the simmering discontent that was going on in england so after 11 long years charles was finally forced to call parliament back again you see, there was a revolt going on in Scotland, and he desperately needed money to uh, raise an army to put it down. Um, so, you know, he didn't really want to do it, but he had no other choice. And so Parliament resumed again in April of 1640. Now, you can imagine after 11 years of not having a Parliament, the parliamentarians had a lot of grievances to air. And almost immediately, it became um, a, a list of sort of complaints about the king uh, wanting to pass new rules, that the king would be forced to call Parliament more frequently. And uh, Charles realized that he had made a horrible mistake. And just a few weeks later in May, he shut it down um, because it was such a short parliament this little brief blip after 11 years it's known as the short parliament in english history however charles's need for money didn't go away the revolt continued to cause him problems in scotland and over the summer it got a little bit worse and so charles reluctantly in the fall of 1640 decided to call parliament again however this time it would be different the so-called Long Parliament that opened on November of 1640 would actually sit for the next 20 years, and it would bear witness to a dramatic transformation of English society in a civil war which would tear apart the country and see the king uh, beheaded. Um, however, in the beginning, it started much the way the short parliament did. Uh, the parliamentarians uh, were not ready to just simply uh, write a blank check uh, to uh, Charles for his Scottish revolt unless he agreed to a number of major concessions. And Charles, of course, had no intention of agreeing to anything like that. Charles got more and more frustrated. In particular, there were um, a few members of the house that he really disliked. And so in January of 1642, he did a major thing. He showed up at Parliament with some armed guards planning to arrest these five members of, of the Parliament. But they had already gotten wind that the king was coming and they, they had already escaped. And when he marched through the doors, he said, I see the birds have flown. Um, and this was a big deal, the king coming in here, because this is one of the major rules in England. Kings are not allowed to enter Parliament, except for one time of the year during the Crown Speech. The rest of the year, they are not allowed in Parliament. Uh, so famously, the Speaker of the House um, stood up to him when the king marched in um, looking for those five members. And the Speaker of the House, William Lenthal, said, May it please your majesty, but I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the House is pleased to direct me, whose servant I am. So this is really the big standoff between king and parliament and who is going to win. Well, first, there's going to be a major civil war. Charles leaves and it begins to raise an army to march on Parliament. And Parliament, for the first time in history, does the same. They raise their own army. So for the next few years, there would be civil war in England. On one side, you had the King of England, Charles I, with his royal army. And on the other side, you had Parliament. For the first time in history, Parliament had its own army. The army that Parliament raised was somewhat unique. It was called the New Model Army. It was made up predominantly of Puritans. Puritans were a minority Protestant Christian faith in England. They tended to very, uh, wear very uh, plain clothing, uh, somewhat uh, Spartan in terms of decoration. And they also cut their hair in a particular way at that time, um, uh, sort of equivalent to maybe what a Beatles haircut would be today. Um, and so they were known by the nickname Roundheads. So you can imagine sort of that bowl cut from like maybe the 1970s. Um, you know, my mom used to do that. She put a bowl in my head and cut, cut the hair around anyway. So Roundheads, that was what the nickname of the new model army was. It was led by a noble named Oliver Cromwell. 
Now, prior to the Civil War, Oliver Cromwell was not that important. He came from sort of a middling uh, noble family, didn't have a whole lot of money. They weren't particularly important or anything. But Oliver Cromwell, this was his chance, and he turned out to be fairly smart, a good tactician, and he was able to um, defeat the king's army in 1646, and the king was in fact um, uh, was captured. He escaped, and then he was recaptured in 1647. So at this point, really, Parliament didn't know what to do with the king. They had him in jail, and there was a lot of debating about what to do, what not to do. And this is where Oliver Cromwell realized that he had an army under his control, and he turned it against Parliament. So once Cromwell turned his army against Parliament, the Civil War takes a very, very different turn. Now, as you can imagine, uh, Cromwell uh, turning against Parliament, um, well, lots of parliamentarians didn't really like this very much. In 1648, uh, Cromwell had one of his colonels, Thomas Pride, show up with an armed force and essentially root out any of the people in Parliament who they felt were against Cromwell and the new model army. It became known as Pride's Purge. Uh, and after this, uh, the Parliament, of course, would only be loyal to Cromwell, it became known as the Rump Parliament because um, it was smaller than the original Parliament after Pride's Purge. At this point, the king was in a very precarious situation because Cromwell and the New Model Army were no friend of the king whatsoever at all. Cromwell uh, would have the king be put on trial. After a show trial on January 30th, 1649, Charles I was executed. Now, this is where we enter into a period of English history where there is no king. It's sometimes referred to as the phrase interregnum. Interregnum means in Latin between kings because, well, spoiler alert, eventually England gets a king again. But there's a period where they don't have a king. Uh, also, another important thing to uh, know is that Charles had two sons, uh, James and Chucky Jr., Charles Jr., and James and Charles Jr. managed to escape to France before everything got really horrible and before their father was arrested and executed. This is important because they come back into the story in a moment. So during the interregnum, this is the period between kings, interregnum, uh, Oliver Cromwell essentially became a dictator for all intents and purposes, which is quite the rise from uh, being a you know, not very well-known noble of middling rank to suddenly becoming the uh, de facto ruler of the realm. Initially, uh, there was uh, the pretense that uh, England was ruled by as a commonwealth, that is, that Parliament was in charge, but pretty soon after that, all pretenses that, it, the, that Cromwell wasn't the real guy in charge were washed away, and it was renamed the Protectorate, and Cromwell was known as the Lord Protector of the Realm. However, this was not a very stable system. I mean, Cromwell wasn't setting up a new dynasty. He didn't have a clear heir. And when he died in 1660, the whole thing sort of collapsed. And at that point, England has been through nearly 20 years of civil war. And what does Parliament do? They kind of just want to go back to the way things were before. So thankfully, the king's two sons, Charles I had two sons, and they had managed to escape. The eldest son, his name was Charles as well, Charles Jr., was invited to come back. So the restoration of 1660 is where we essentially go back to having a king. So Charles II, that was how he would now be called, uh, Chucky Jr., uh, came back and became king. Now, yeah, things were pretty tense almost immediately afterwards. Uh, Charles was very tolerant of Catholicism and Parliament definitely didn't like that. And then Charles dies. And here's the biggest problem. His brother, James II, had actually become Catholic while he was in France. Now, this was just, from the point of view of Parliament, outrageous. Um, and then when James, um, with his uh, second wife, who is very, very Catholic, had a son, and there was the potential that we would now have Catholic kings from now on in England, well, Parliament, again, had had enough. And thankfully, in a weird twist of fate, um, James, in an earlier marriage, had had a daughter, and that daughter had actually been raised as a Protestant abroad in the Netherlands, and she had actually married a powerful Protestant um, uh, baron named William of Orange. And so Parliament said, hey, um, your dad, we don't like him very much. We'd 
love it if you and your husband came over and, and took over. And so this was the glorious revolution. And yes, William of Orange and his wife, Mary Stuart, who is the daughter of the current king, James II, invaded. You can imagine that the family, you know, dinner table conversations would not be great. There's a little bit of bad blood be between uh, father and daughter, I would imagine. Uh, James um, uh, escapes, and yeah, at one point he does try to reclaim his, his throne, but it just doesn't work out. The Glorious Revolution in 1688 would essentially cement the um, a relationship between the crown and parliament as being um, one of cooperation and one of mutual respect where each side understands the limits of their power. From that point onward, England would be a constitutional monarchy. Um, the monarch would not really have real power. Power would reside in parliament and that is where it still resides to this day. So I'd like to transition now from talking about kingship to talking about the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. And this is really a major moment in the history of Western civilization. Once we reach the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, we are truly transitioning from a medieval early modern era into something truly modern. And the enlightenment, of course, will lead directly to the French Revolution. It's the ideas that really transformed us into a modern liberal democratic society in the West. And once we have the French Revolution, most historians date the modern period as starting from that moment. So this is the big movement, the big transformation that we've been waiting for. So how do we get to the scientific revolution and the enlightenment? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to the Middle Ages. If you recall, we talked about some major changes that happened in Europe during the 12th century. This was the time when the medieval warming period was at its height. Agriculture was more productive and we had a massive population increase. Europe was also more at peace and we saw a renewed growth in cities. Urbanization became important again. And this was also when we started to see the traditional threefold division of medieval society begin to become more complicated. Originally, it was those that worked, the peasants, those that fought, the nobles, and those that prayed, the clergy or the church. But now, during the 12th century, we start to see a new group of people, the townspeople, the bourgeoisie, or the beginnings of the middle class. And it is that middle class that ultimately sends their sons and daughters to school and sparks the Renaissance in southern Italy. The Renaissance is a renewed interest in literacy and it ultimately leads to um, uh, our idea of humanism and all of that literacy and all of that questioning will ultimately lead to the Protestant Reformation and this of course is all fueled by the printing press which is spreading it all around Europe. This is what leads us in the late 16th century to the beginnings of the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution is a revolution that would affect the intellectual class of Europe and it would begin with a questioning about our place in the universe and our place in nature and it would question some of the old assumptions about those things. Finally, the Enlightenment would take the ideals of the scientific revolution and apply them to the human world. So we would be looking at our society. Why do we have to have kings? Is this the best way for us to organize ourselves? Is there such a thing as human rights, equality, and justice under the law? That was what the Enlightenment would all be about. And together, the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment is what will produce the modern world. So if you recall in the last podcast, I talked about how it was a myth that at any point in time, educated people thought the world was flat because they didn't. They realized that the world was round. Um, and, and that was true for most cultures around the world for their educated classes. However, the same cannot be said for the belief that the earth is the center of the universe. In that case, everyone believed that. Everyone believed that the planets and the sun all orbited the earth. This is what we call geocentric theory. And this was at the foundation of, of the European education program when it came to the natural world and understanding the universe. It was held uh, as um, an irrefutable truth that was established thousands of years ago by ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. However, 
during the Renaissance and thereafter, we start to see more of a questioning of these old authority figures. The word authority in Latin is auctoritas, and during the Middle Ages, auctoritas carried a lot of weight. These are the texts that we just don't question. The highest of auctoritas would be the Bible, the Christian Bible, followed by um, early Christian writings by Christian fathers such as Augustine or Jerome. And then below that, but still very important, would be ancient Greek philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato. And these people were believed to be never wrong. You can't question them. They are the authorities. The problem is, is that cracks began to show in these authority figures once we reached the early modern period. One of the first um, of these ancient uh, philosophers who's um, ideas began to be questioned was Ptolemy. So Ptolemy, um, as we talked about in the previous podcast, was um, a, uh, a Greek-Egyptian um, philosopher who wrote during the uh, period of the Roman Empire some of the basic geography textbooks uh, that all Europeans used. And they had been largely correct. They, you know, identified that China existed and India existed and roughly had them in their right places. But Ptolemy had one major error in that he did not know about the Americas and that he was proven to be completely wrong about that. When uh, Columbus, um, a quote unquote, discovered or rediscovered the Americas for European audiences. If Ptolemy could be wrong about the Americas, perhaps he could be wrong about other things. Another problem that was occurring in uh, the European educated world in the early modern period was issues to do with the calendar. The calendar that everyone was using uh, during that time was a calendar that had been um, established during the ancient Roman period by Julius Caesar. It was known as the Julian calendar. However, the Julian calendar was not perfectly accurate. It was out of sync and over many, many years, uh, the religious holidays such as Easter and Christmas became out of sync with the seasons that they actually needed to be in. And this again was because of not very accurate understanding of exactly how long the solar year was. So in 1582, it was replaced by a major improvement, the Gregorian calendar, which tried to correct these uh, problems. So these are challenges to the old authority figures. They're being shown that they can be wrong on occasion. And if they can be wrong, perhaps there are other things that they didn't get right also. So what do we mean when we talk about the scientific revolution? Well, first of all, it's not a revolution where anybody was killed or a government was overthrown. It's not a traditional political or social revolution. And in fact, um, many historians have suggested that it's not a very good term for us to use and that it's partially kind of invented by historians in the sense that it's a very gradual process, took place over hundreds of years. The people who were involved themselves, they didn't know that they were participating in a quote unquote scientific revolution. And in fact, the very word science wasn't even invented yet. Uh, the word science doesn't come into use until the 1800s. It's based off of a Latin word, scientia, which means knowledge. No, in fact, the people who were participating in the scientific revolution probably would have described themselves as philosophers. Um, and they're not at all like modern scientists. They often have, um, you know, superstitious beliefs. They might believe in alchemy or astrology at the same time that they're doing these revolutionary new ideas. Um, they are holding these contradictory beliefs. So they're not really like modern scientists, not yet. Um, the whole idea of the scientific revolution ultimately grows out of the developments of humanism during the Renaissance. In particular, the idea of questioning authorities, that sometimes authorities get it wrong. Sometimes auctoritas, the Latin word for authority, is wrong. We saw that with Ptolemy, and eventually we'll see it with Aristotle and Plato and other people who believe that everything orbited the, um, the Earth rather than the Earth and the planets orbiting the Sun, which is, of course, what is, um, what is the reality. Um, and in fact, the scientific revolution, it does lay the foundation for all modern science, astronomy, physics, biology, mathematics. But again, during the scientific re revolution, these subjects were not really separate from one another. Um, often people who are interested in one thing are contributing to several different subject areas.
Traditionally, historians date the scientific revolution from the publication of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus in 1543, which sort of launches it, um, uh, to the pinnacle of the scientific revolution, which is Isaac Newton's publication of Principia in 1687. And it's Principia that really lays the foundations for modern physics. Um, Principia establishes the laws of motion, the theory of gravity. It's what allows us to have satellites in space, and it's what allowed us to get to the moon. So pretty important stuff. So the scientific revolution traditionally begins with this guy, Nicholas Copernicus, when he published his famous book, De Revolutionibus, in 1543. Now, a few things you have to know about Copernicus. First of all, he was really risk adverse and he recognized that his idea, his basic idea that the earth was not the center of everything, uh, that in fact, the earth was just one of several planets that orbited the sun and that it was the sun that was the center was revolutionary to say the least. Uh, so he, in fact, um, did not want his book published. He was a canon in the church, and he knew that it wouldn't go over very well. It was only on his deathbed that he finally allowed this book to be published. Even though he had privately, amongst his colleagues, discussed his ideas for many years, they finally convinced him when he was dying to let his book be published. So what was it about this book that was so influential? Well, first of all, it turned everything that we knew about astronomy on its head. It said, no, the Earth is not the center of everything. In fact, it's the Sun, and that the planets, uh, Earth being one of them, orbit the Sun. Now, Copernicus had some things wrong. First of all, he had the planets orbiting in uh, perfect circles, which we now know uh, is not correct, but he had the planets roughly in their right order. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. He didn't know, of course, about uh, Uranus or Neptune yet. Um, now, Copernicus uh, didn't argue, per se, that the physical Earth-centric model was wrong, although he probably uh, privately believed it. He rather said that, really, it just it's such a beautiful theory. If you imagine that the Sun is at the center, the math just makes sense. Suddenly the math makes sense is basically his argument. When the book was published, the publisher actually appended that, uh, a little uh, note at the beginning of it, which argues, which basically said that the heliocentric theory, uh, which is the sun-centered theory, this is his new revolutionary idea, is, is simply a mathematical model that if you're, you know, if you wanna look at the math, isn't this interesting that if we put the sun at the center, suddenly all the math makes sense. So even the publisher was reluctant to put down that this was 100% true because everyone knew that this would not go over well. But this book would be incredibly influential to later generations. So the next really important person that we need to talk about in the history of science is Galileo Galilei. So Galileo was born after the death of Copernicus. But what Galileo did was he actually provided empirical evidence to back up Copernicus's theory. That is evidence that we can see with our eyes. Empirical evidence is evidence that you gather in the world to back up an idea. And how Galileo did this is he took a brand new invention, an invention that was, you know, just had come onto the scene during his lifetime, the telescope, and he pointed it at the sky. The telescope, um, the earliest account of it we have is around 1608 from a patent in the Netherlands, um, and it quickly spread after that. Now we know that lenses um, have a much longer history going back in time. The Greeks knew about properties to do with uh, spherical lenses and how um, light um, and, and images appear differently when you look through it, but it was the earliest form of a telescope we have is in the early 1600s. And Galileo pointed it at the sky and what he saw amazed him. So Galileo published several books in his lifetime. Um, in them, he drew careful drawings of the moon, which he now um, uh, recognized was not a perfect um, flawless sphere, but instead was covered with craters. He was the first person to see the moons of Jupiter, which proved that other planets also had a similar orbiting system to the Copernicus system, which was orbiting the sun. And then on top of that, he also uh, drew some of the best drawings we ever had uh, to that date of the uh, rings of Saturn. However, Galileo's ideas were fiercely opposed by the church in 1633. Uh, Galileo had um, found himself on 
uh, the um, uh, wrong side of Pope Urban VIII, and he found himself arrested and accused of heresy and tried by the Inquisition. And in the end, he was found guilty of heresy and he was forced to recant. Sadly, he spent uh, much of the remainder of his life under house arrest and he died penniless, not knowing just how influential his work uh, would be. But it's Galileo who gives us the first glimpse that what Copernicus was saying actually is true. Now, the scientific revolution didn't just make major advances in astronomy. It also made advances in life sciences as well. Throughout the Middle Ages, most uh, people who were trained doctors believed very firmly in Galen. Galen was a um, uh, Roman um, uh, philosopher and writer who in the second century CE had written some of the defining textbooks on the human body which were used for all uh, universities and medical schools during the Middle Ages. Now the thing is is Galen had it completely wrong. He believed that the body was made up of four humors uh, that when we got sick, it was it was because those humors got out of whack with one another. And doctors in the Middle Ages interpreted this, that the best way to heal pretty much any sickness was to bleed people. Needless to say, that was not a good way of, um, of recovering from illness. However, during the um, uh, 16th century, we see two people, Andreas Vesalius and William Harvey, both of whom started to produce some of the most detailed examinations of the human body that we had yet uh, to date. Um, the way they did this was um, by actually gathering empirical evidence. So uh, Vesalius um, famously dissected corpses and looked at what the body looked like inside. And from his drawings, we actually have the very first uh, beginnings of understanding how the human body actually worked. And William Harvey did experiments where he, um, and some of these experiments are somewhat gruesome, but he figured out that blood actually circulates around the body. Um, so both of these guys were really changing the way we looked at um, uh, medicine and moving away again from another Octoritas, another authority figure. So Galen, like Ptolemy, starts to fade away and replaced by a new way of looking at the world. So this brings us to what most people would consider the pinnacle of the scientific revolution, and that's Isaac Newton and the publication of his foundational work, Principia. Principia would establish the laws of motion, the theory of gravity, and it absolutely lays the foundation for modern science as we know it. It's Newton's uh, theories that allow us to put satellites into outer space. It's what allowed us to land people on the moon. And really, they are still foundational to um, everything we're, we know today in terms of science. It wouldn't really even be updated until the 20th century with the publication of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. So you can't really um, underestimate just how important Isaac Newton's work is. That being said, he's also a really good example of how we can't really imagine these people as modern scientists. He wouldn't have considered himself a scientist. He would have thought of himself as a natural philosopher. And he believed all kinds of crazy things at the same time that he was developing these foundational scientific works. Uh, he believed in alchemy, for example. Um, alchemy is um, this uh, magical quest uh, to find um, a way to uh, turn any object into gold. And he was obsessed with this. Um, he was obsessed with the occult as well. So it's just something to keep in mind that when we're talking about the scientific revolution, um, we shouldn't um, overlay that with our modern ideas of science, even though this is the incubation period where modern science begins to emerge. And uh, look no further than Principia and Isaac Newton uh, for the achievements of the scientific revolution. So now let's turn to the other phenomenon the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment will um, expand on the scientific revolution by looking at the human world. So the Enlightenment is in many ways a natural extension of the scientific revolution. In fact, it's hard to really disentangle them. They're part of the same movement. In some cases, some of the people who were contributing to the scientific revolution were also contributing to the Enlightenment as well. 
But to me, at least, the Enlightenment is in many ways more important than the scientific revolution. It's the Enlightenment which transforms us into thoroughly modern people. It transforms the way we live, how we understand our place in society, and how we structure our government. Sometimes the Enlightenment is described as applying the principles of the scientific revolution to political and social thought. So what do I mean by that? If the scientific revolution was challenging long-held assumptions about the universe, about the natural world, about the human body, the Enlightenment was challenging long-held assumptions about society and how we organize ourselves in society. For example, why do we have kings? Are they necessary for government? Could we organize ourselves a different way? Why are some people born with special privileges as nobles? Is that fair? Are all people actually equal? Throughout the Enlightenment, we see this critical spirit and optimism about human progress. People are talking about ideas that are thoroughly new and transformative. New concepts such as human rights, the separation of church and state, and freedom of expression are all concepts that are invented during the Enlightenment. These are ideas which we hold dear to this day in the Western world, so really, really important. Now, the irony is, is that the Enlightenment really has its heart in France, the one place where we really see a top-down power structure with absolute kings who have complete control. And it's in that environment, believe it or not, where we actually see a lot of the early writing on the Enlightenment. The people who are participating in this movement are uh, known as philosophes. That's what they called themselves. Uh, philosophes are people who are interested in the world. So philosophes sometimes write about the natural world, but sometimes they write about the human world as well. So next, we're just going to go through a few of the really important Enlightenment thinkers, and then we're going to talk about the major consequence of the Enlightenment, which is the French Revolution. The first Enlightenment thinker I want to talk to you about is John Locke. And John Locke is important, first of all, because he's one of the earliest writers and he influenced nearly all the later philosophers. His uh, principal um, idea that was really influential was this concept called the social contract. John Locke believed that kings were necessary, but under the social contract, he believed that kings had a duty to the people and people had a duty to the king as well. A contract of sorts that both sides are participating in. On the king's side, his responsibilities would be to provide justice and to provide security to the people, to provide a fair and responsive government. For the people's side, their responsibility would be to uh, follow the laws and be good subjects. Now here's the thing about the social contract. If one side is breaking the contract, then that opens up the possibility that a king could be overthrown. So if you have a bad king, a king that's not fulfilling their end of the bargain, then well, a king could be overthrown. So this concept of a social contract, it's a really uh, simple idea, but it goes against this concept of the divine right of kings. Under John Locke's ideas, there is no divine right that kings have, that rather kings hold their power as a balance of a social contract with the people underneath them. So um, it's from John Locke that we begin this real discussion about something that we would call uh, classic liberalism. Classic liberalism is not the way we would use the word liberal today, which tends to be um, a term that's used to describe, say, the left side of the political spectrum. When we're talking about liberalism during the Enlightenment, we're talking about this idea that, that government is not all powerful, that government should ha be limited and, and that it uh, has to work within the law and that people, individuals in society have rights as well. That's what John Locke would have thought of as classical liberalism and it fits right in with this idea of the social the next Enlightenment thinker that I want to introduce you to is Voltaire. And when we think of the Enlightenment, Voltaire usually is the first person that comes to mind. Um, Voltaire wasn't, in, interestingly enough, it wasn't his uh, real name. Uh, he was born Francois Marie Arrou. Um, so he, um, uh, he took Voltaire as a pen name, kind of like um, Drake. Aubrey Graham is his real name, but Drake is the name he goes by. So, you know, in some ways, Voltaire was the Drake of his day, the Zendaya of his day. Um, 
he was middle class. Like many of the people who are contributing to the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, he's not from the noble class. So he's from this wealthy merchant background. Um, and it's from this group of people ever since the 12th century that we're starting to see all this massive change uh, in the world. And it's continuing through the enlightenment. So um, the main contributions of Voltaire was this idea of freedom of religion. That was a concept that was not considered good in his era. The idea that we should have multiple people believing different things, living side by side, that would have been considered crazy, that it's just going to lead to fighting. But Voltaire argued that no, religion should be, people should be free to worship in the way that they um, believe. He also believed in freedom of expression and the separation of church and state. That's very important. The idea that if you're going to have freedom of religion, then the state has to be neutral. It can't pick sides. It can't just be one religion or another one. It has to be a neutral arbitrator of sorts. And that's from Voltaire. The next person I want to talk about is Metesca. Now, Metesca, um, it's, he's known as Metesca. His full name is Charles Louis de Secondin, de Berdon, de la Brede et de Montesquieu. He's the only one of these Enlightenment thinkers that actually comes from the nobility. Most of the Enlightenment thinkers, as I mentioned in the previous slide, are from this merchant middle class. But Metesca was part of the um, uh, nobility. Metesca's great contribution is this idea of the three-part separation of powers in government. Um, the idea that government should be separated with checks and balances, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Nowhere is this more clear than in the United States. Now, as we'll talk about in a moment, the United States was one of the Enlightenment uh, products. It was the revolution, the American Revolution was born out of Enlightenment ideas. And when the um, uh, American revolutionaries sat down and came up with their constitution and how they were going to organize their government, they took straight out of Metesca his idea of creating a check and balance system of power. So in the United States, the executive would be made up of the president. The president, um, in this case, I guess, in right now, currently, when this recording is taking place, it's Donald Trump. The legislative is Congress in the United States. So this is the Senate and the House of Representatives. And the judicial is the Supreme Court. Under Metesca's idea, each of these three parts of government has equal power and they can check each other so that, you know, the executive can't have too much power, um, nor could the legislative. They check each other's power. And this was uh, Metesca's great and really, really powerfully influential idea about how to organize government. The last person I want to introduce you to is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, so he was a very important political philosopher in France. Again, he's still from, he's from the same background as Voltaire, so merchant middle class. Um, and his ideas would have a direct influence on the French Revolution which is what we're leading up to with the Enlightenment. Uh, so he wrote two important works, The Discourse on the Origin of Inequality and On the Social Contract. And in these, he sort of expanded upon John Locke's original idea of the social contract and came up with a concept that he called the general will. And under the general will, the idea is that society will be governed by the collective wishes of the people and that the general will is the most important thing. You could think of it of a sort as democracy of a sort, but you could also think of it as um, a majority rules. And during the French Revolution, the general will could also do some pretty horrible things. It will be the general will that will send people to the guillotine, for example. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau didn't actually live to see the French Revolution. He didn't actually live to see his ideas twisted in this way. And it's always been interesting to me to imagine what he might have thought about had he lived to have seen it. So this brings us to the main event, the French Revolution. The French Revolution, for most historians, is a major event. It's a turning point in history. It's usually what is the um, sort of dividing line between the early modern period and the modern period. In fact, some might argue that we're still living in the period that the French Revolution ushered in the modern world. So what you see here is an image, a painting of French soldiers marching off to war during the French Revolution. Um, the French Revolution lasted nearly 20 years, and it was marked by near constant warfare during that time. And when those wars were happening, 
French citizens would be um, called upon to join in on the fight, not because they were um, uh, forced to as subjects, but rather as citizens, as their responsibility as citizens. And this is one of the big contributions of the French Revolution, is this concept of nationalism. And this is an infectious idea. It begins first in France, but it spreads everywhere as people transform from subjects into citizens. So the French Revolution, um, we're going to uh, take a look at the basic narrative structure of what happened during it, but we're going to see how Enlightenment ideas get twisted and turned. We're going to see it take its uh, very bloody course during the Terror. So let's get started. So I want to talk first about one of the precursors to the French Revolution, and that's the American Revolution. The American Revolution um, was also a product of the Enlightenment. The American Revolution uh, saw the former 13 colonies of, of Britain um, along the um, eastern seaboard of the United States rebel against their mother country. And against all odds, those American colonists were able to actually create their own country. They actually won. They beat Britain. Uh, it set the precedent. It said that Enlightenment ideas were real, that they could actually change the world. Um, and what's really ironic, I suppose, for the French monarchy, which would, of course, be destroyed during the French Revolution, is that they supported those revolutionaries because France, of course, was a rival with uh, Britain and they did not want to see um, um, the Britain become more powerful and they loved the idea of being able to um, uh, stick it to them by supporting the um, supporting the revolutionary. So France actually played a role in the in the American Revolution. They supported it financially. They even sent some tacticians uh, to help the uh, American revolutionaries. And they went into debt, in fact, to do this. Uh, this is ironic because the same Enlightenment ideas would come back to haunt them during the French Revolution. So let's talk about French society, um, where the revolution would actually take place. So earlier on in this podcast, we talked about how French kings had become all powerful, that they were absolutist kings. That means that they pretty much could do what they wanted. The thing is, is that, you know, French society had changed in many ways, like the rest of Europe had changed. If you recall, during the Middle Ages, we had three groups of people generally. Everyone fit into one of those three groups, the nobles, those that fought, the uh, clergy, those that pray, and the peasants, those that work. Um, and then we saw this new group of people emerge during the Renaissance, and that is the townsfolk, the merchant class, or the middle class. And that certainly had happened in French society too. But legally, they were still stuck in the Middle Ages. So legally in France, you were a member of one of three groups. Everyone was. They called them estates. The first estate was the clergy, those that pray. Approximately 130,000 uh, people were the first estate. The second estate was the nobility, those that fight. 350,000 people were roughly uh, a part of that. And the third estate was the vast majority. This is the commoners, those that work. The thing is, is that by the time we get to the French Revolution, the third estate is far more complicated than that. It also includes very, very wealthy very wealthy merchant class people, uh, people like, um, you know, who are producing Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire. Um, the third estate, in some cases, is, is, is got wealthier people than the nobility. Uh, this, so the third estate is not a homogeneous group. It's a large group of people. And legally, the first two estates have privileges that the third estate doesn't have. Um, and this is what creates this sort of unfair... Uh, tipping point in French society. So here you see a cartoon here from uh, from that time period where you see the common people being crushed by privilege. So you see the first two estates, the nobles and the clergy, uh, stepping on a big heavy rock and poor third estate guy is being crushed ah! underneath that rock. Uh, so here you see another cartoon where the poor third estate um, has got on his back uh, the um, rather rotund um, noble and a member of the clergy as well and together they're riding on top of the third estate so 
you know, obviously um, these cartoons are demonstrating that a lot of people in French society thought that this system was completely unfair. So what was it? What was the straw that broke the camel's back? What actually ended the what they call the ancien régime, which uh, just means the old regime? So what actually brought them into crisis? So there are uh, several factors. First of all, um, heavy debts. Um, so France had gotten into tons of debt um, uh, during the American Revolution by supporting the American Revolutionaries. So the king had borrowed a lot of money. And kings before, at this point, it's Louis XVI. So two kings after our friend Louis XIV that we talked about in the early podcast. But ever since Louis XIV, kings had been borrowing money to go to war and, and build huge palaces like Versailles. So there was quite a bit of debt. Now, the problem was, is there wasn't much of a means to collect money to actually pay that debt down. It was a very antiquated system of collecting revenue. Under this system, the wealthiest people, the nobility and the clergy, didn't pay any tax at all. So the third estate paid all the taxes. So obviously that is an unsustainable situation when you have tons of heavy debts. The other problem is that there was all these entrenched noble privileges. Uh, so nobles um, had um, power in many different ways. So first of all, they were part of the few um, checks and balances on, on absolute kings. So in France, they were a member of the Parlement, which we talked about earlier in the podcast. And the Parlement was sort of a law co co court that interpreted the king's rules. Um, and the third estate just had none of these privileges. The uh, third uh, factor was that this is the center of the Enlightenment in France, and there was a lot of public opinion that the only way to solve the problems of French society was radical change. And uh, France being the center of the Enlightenment, where philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau were talking and spreading ideas, meant that France, French society was ripe for something like a revolution. And number four, the final factor which leads to the tipping point of the French Revolution is in the summers before the French Revolution, there was a series of very bad harvests in the year before. Um, and just because of weather patterns, there was not a whole lot of food to go around and the price of bread skyrocketed. And so there were people literally starving in the streets on the eve of the French Revolution. And this was the match that would light um, light the fire of the French Revolution. So here is the king who was uh, in control of France at the time. So it's not Louis the 14th. We're a couple of Louis down the line. This is Louis the 16th. And Louis, uh, you know, I, I don't think he was a particularly uh, cruel king or anything, but he was certainly a king that was out of touch with the problems of his country. And he really um, handled the crisis very poorly. He didn't really know how to react, and most of his decisions actually made things worse. Uh, his his wife often, um, his wife Marie Antoinette, um, often gets a bad rap as well. Um, a lot of the propaganda during the French Revolution painted her also as very out of touch. Um, there's a famous phrase uh, associated with her that when she was told that the price of bread was uh, so um, expensive that peasants couldn't buy it, she said, well, if they can't afford bread, let them eat cake which was meant to show just how out of touch she is. We don't think that Mary Antoinette actually said that. We think that was just propaganda that came out during the French Revolution. There's zero evidence to suggest that she actually said that herself, but um, she was certainly associated with this completely out of touch, noble, privileged class. So in the summer of 1789, we have um, people starving in the streets. We regularly have bread riots. Things are starting to get pretty bad. And even the king recognizes that something needs to be done. And so he turns to a man named Jacques Necker, who was a banker from Geneva, and he made him his finance minister. Now, Necker is an interesting fellow. First of all, he had actually written some Enlightenment writing himself. He was a strong believer in a constitutional monarchy. Um, so not maybe the obvious choice to appoint into a position, um, but he was willing to try some radical things to try to solve the problems in France. And so what he advised uh, Louis the 16th to do in the summer of 1789 is something that hadn't been done in nearly 200 years, and that was to call the Estates General. 
Now, the Estates General, uh, if you recall, we talked about it very briefly at the beginning of this podcast. The Estates General was a representative body that had no real power. But perhaps if uh, the king could get the Estates General to agree to some sort of radical um, changes, perhaps to the taxation system to allow the taxation of nobles or the clergy, then he would be able to move ahead with something that um, uh, otherwise he might not have been able to do. Even absolute kings, there's a limit to what they can get away with. And when it comes to taxing and getting rid of the noble privileges, that was one of the limits of what even absolute kings would find themselves uh, hard-pressed to do that. And so Necker convinces him to call the Estates General. Now, the Estates General, uh, the way it works is it has representatives from all three estates of French society. So there's representatives from the first estate, the clergy, the second estate, the nobles, and the third estate, which is everybody else. Now, the way that votes happen is each uh, estate gets one essentially vote in the Estates General. Now, the problem of this is that um, the first two estates are obviously always going to outvote the third estate. So any radical changes, um, they're always going to overturn. And in, and in this instance, their self-interest, um, that they didn't want to be taxed, they didn't want any uh, major changes, meant that the states general didn't end up doing anything. And almost immediately, it fell into bickering and arguing, and uh, it just was not going very well at all. Lots of arguing. And so the third estate, um, it, which in this case was made up of a lot of fairly well-educated uh, merchant class level um, enlightenment thinkers um, began to essentially take matters into their own hands. They declared that they were the true voice of France and that they renamed themselves the National Assembly. At this point, we are looking at uh, a fiasco, really. And the whole idea of calling the Estates General, uh, which had been Necker's idea, um, is looking really, really foolish. And so the king tells Necker, shut it down, shut it down. And so the next day they organize troops to come and bar the doors to the assembly room so that the people can't get in. Now, this is one of those pivotal moments in history where the French Revolution might not have happened. Um, except that the National Assembly or that third state decided that being locked out was not going to stop them. So on June 20th, 1789, the National Assembly, as it's now calling itself, has found itself locked out of the assembly room where the Estates General is being held. There are troops barring the door. So what do they do? This crowd of people they decide to walk down the street and they find the first open building that they could get into. And as it turns out, it was an indoor tennis court of the Kings. And they went inside and something remarkable happened. After much talk, they swore an oath that became known as the Tennis Court Oath. And they said that they would not rest until France had a new constitution which declared equality for all people. This is the beginnings of the French Revolution. So needless to say, things are not going good for the king in the summer of 1789. The idea of holding the Estates General turned out to be a really bad decision from his point of view, and so one of the first things that he does is he blames it all on Jacques Necker, the man that he had hired to try to solve his problems. The thing is, is that Jacques Necker was actually really popular amongst the people. And once um, word got out that Necker had been fired, that really is the spark that uh, blows everything up. And from June 11th onward, uh, Paris and other places uh, start to essentially um, um, become ruled by mobs. Um, on July 14th, the center of royal power in Paris, the Bastille, which was a uh, fortress um, and a prison, and it's also where all of the armaments and the guns were held, uh, was stormed by crowds. They broke open the gates, they executed the commander, and seized all the weapons. Usually, the storming of the Bastille on July 14th is truly the beginning of the violent revolution. This is where things begin to uh, turn completely against the king. Um, there's si simultaneous wave of uprisings across the countryside and in different cities in France, and eventually even the French king, the king's soldiers, begin to join uh, this new um, uh, mob militia that forms, and the French Revolution is fully underway.
So after the storming of Besti, the king technically remains. He's holed up in his uh, palace of Versailles, um, uh, pretty much uh, powerless. He, over time, begins to lose more and more of his power. Essentially, the country is now being controlled by the National Assembly, the, the group of the Third Estate who had taken the tennis court oath. Um, the National Assembly uh, begins to keep its word. They had sworn an oath that they would find, a, uh, they would draft a new constitution for France, and they were true to their word. The Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen is a really interesting document. It's there's a um, section of it that you can read in your textbook. In it, it essentially um, does away with all of the old noble privilege in France, the abolition of feudalism, and any of the privileges of the first two estates makes people equal under the law um, and in many ways is, is similar to the American Constitution um, that came out of the American Revolution. So over time in the French Revolution though it starts to become much more radical and certainly from 1791 onwards so now we're a couple of years into the revolution things begin to become a little bit more radical and there are a couple of groups that I want to introduce you to. One is the sans culotte you'll see an idealized image of a sans culotte in the center there. Um, so sans culotte means literally without um, culottes. So what is a culotte? A culotte is, uh, if you look at the picture on the left, it's a cartoon making fun of Louis the 16th, the king. A culotte is, is, are these little uh, pantaloons that go to just the knee and then you wear tights uh, from there onward. Um, this is what all men of a certain social class upwards would be wearing. So this would also include a lot of members of the third estate would wear culottes, the wealthier merchant class people, people who were at the National Assembly, for example, would have worn culottes. People who didn't wear culottes, who just wore pants, uh, were the working class. They These were the equivalent of the blue collar workers, the peasants. And the culottes were the group of people who made up most of the mobs in the streets that, were, that had originally been starving and who had taken control into their own hands. So the sans culottes over time become much, much more radical. They begin to um, uh, randomly arrest noble people, put them on trial, sometimes execute them um, without any trial. Uh, so they're one very radical group that's turning the French Revolution much more bloody. The other radical group are the Jacobins, and this is a political faction of the National Assembly. It's a small minority group within the National Assembly that begins to exert an out of whack control. Um, their leader is Maximilien de Robespierre, and you see his picture there on the right hand side. The Jacobins believed in a radical departure from everything of the past, and they particularly uh, believed that the king needed to be gotten rid of completely. Um, uh, read into that, executed, and they also believed that they had enemies everywhere. Eventually, the Jacobins would seize complete control over the revolution and over the National Assembly. So by 1793, uh, the Jacobins had essentially seized control of the government. They renamed the National Assembly the National Convention. And the Jacobins saw enemies everywhere. First and foremost, they wanted to wipe away everything from the past. The king, who had been imprisoned under arrest, uh, was put on trial. And in January 1793, Louis XVI was executed in front of a crowd of spectators by guillotine. The guillotine was a contraption that was put into major use during the French Revolution. Uh, it was um, um, uh, consisted of a huge heavy blade that would come thundering down, chopping off the victim's head. And here you see an image of Marie Antoinette, uh, the king's uh, wife and queen, who was executed several months after her husband in October of 1793. The Jacobins set up uh, the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds all nice and happy, but it definitely was anything but. The Committee of Public Safety, which was led by Maximilien Robespierre, that was the man that I showed you the image of in the last uh, slide. Maximilien Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety was in charge of finding anyone that they thought was against the revolution or against the Jacobins. Neighbors were encouraged to rat out neighbors. Suddenly, political opinion became a matter of life and death. If you were against the Jacobins, therefore you were against the revolution and you should be executed. 
Um, so we think at least 16,500 people were executed by guillotine across France during 1793 and 1794 during what became known as the terror. A lot of them were nobles, but not all of them. Um, many uh, peasants were also executed as well too. Uh, the National Convention eventually um, uh, grew tired of the terror and got their courage and stood up to the Jacobins. Um, it happened because Maximilien Robespierre stood in front of the National Convention with a list in his hand, threatening that there were going to be members from this very room that would likely meet their end on the guillotine. And that was finally the push that they needed. And um, fearing for their own lives, they rebelled against Maximilien Robespierre and the Jacobins. Maximilien Robespierre himself was executed in July of 1794 by guillotine, and the terror finally comes to an end. Which brings us to the part of the revolution, which in many ways is, is one of the most interesting, uh, the rise of Napoleon. So uh, after the reign of terror, the French government um, still had to contend with a lot of the problems of society. They no longer had a king. Um, they still had plenty of wars uh, going on. Just about every European country had ganged up on France because they didn't want to see the same revolution happen in their own countries. And so uh, there was near constant warfare and the government um, really needed uh, some something uh, to rally the people behind. And in this, they found a young Corsican general named Napoleon. So the first thing you need to know about Napoleon is that he's not French. He's from an island called Corsica, which is in the Mediterranean. And they don't speak French in Corsica. They speak Corsican. Uh, Napoleon was a from a minor noble family. They didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, Corsica had been taken over by France um, some time before that. And so uh, Napoleon's father believed that Napoleon's best chance of success would be to um, go to a military school with other uh, sons of French nobles in mainland France. And so uh, Napoleon went there, um, would have learned French, and uh, went to school and was educated in um, this military fashion. Now, had the French Revolution never happened, he likely wouldn't have gone very far because he wasn't a French noble. He wouldn't have risen through the ranks very high. But um, he did rise through the ranks because he was uh, very smart and he was a good tactician in battle. He became a hero for his successful military campaigns in Italy and even Egypt. Um, and Napoleon became this bright spot for the French uh, government to use as propaganda to say, hey, um, things are turning around, everyone. We've got this handsome young general who is winning all these battles. So Napoleon was immensely popular, to say the least. Napoleon was also ambitious, however, and with some other members of the government, he seized control in a coup in November of 1799. And now the government consisted of Napoleon and just Napoleon. He declared himself emperor in 1804 and now we can say the French Revolution has truly reached its logical absurd end. We started with an absolutist king and we end with an absolutist emperor in 1804. However, in many ways though Napoleon was progressive and he did change things and he considered that the revolution uh, wasn't over. He said the revolution is me was the way he described it. So the years that Napoleon is emperor from 1804 to 1815 uh, in some ways uh, did restore a little bit of normalcy to French life. Uh, Napoleon was able to impose stability and he also fulfilled some of the goals of the revolution by reforming the government. Um, under Napoleon, everyone was equal except for Napoleon, he was special, but everyone else was equal under the law. So in that sense, he was fulfilling the revolution. He was getting rid of the old noble privileges that had uh, caused so many problems before. Um, uh, Napoleon also um, was very successful as a general. He completely turned the tide of war. Um, he was, uh, in fact, able to conquer much of Europe. And in doing so, he began to export these ideas of reform and nationalism, which had been born in the French Revolution. Um, all of Europe, essentially, at one point was under his control. And wherever he went, he created what were called sister republics. Um, he did away with uh, the noble privileges in the new countries. And this, of course, sowed the seeds for revolution everywhere else as well. 
Eventually, though, Napoleon's luck changes. Um, in 1812, the tide began to turn. He made a very foolish mistake, which was he ambitiously decided to um, invade Russia. And if you know your history, it is always a bad idea to invade Russia. Um, Napoleon uh, went in with um, uh, perhaps 600 to 700,000 troops. Um, uh, and uh, when winter set in, they were ill-equipped and the Russians proved to be a more fierce enemy than anything he had imagined. And by the time they were coming out of Russia in defeat, only a small fraction, perhaps around 150,000 troops remained. Napoleon eventually was forced to abdicate and he was exiled by the victors to a small island called Elba in 1814. However, he had a brief um, a moment of return where he escaped from Elba and he rallied some troops again and he finally was defeated for the last time at Waterloo in 1815. And this was the end of Napoleon. He would die um, very shortly thereafter. Uh, after this point, the entirety of Europe mostly just wanted to bring things back to the way it was before. So as it happens, Louis XVI's brother had managed to escape France prior to things getting really nasty and people's heads being chopped off. Um, and since the son of the king had also died, um, uh, he was offered the throne as a show of respect uh, to his nephew, who would have been king had he lived. He didn't take uh, the title Louis the uh, uh, 17th, but rather Louis the 18th, recognizing that his um, that his nephew uh, should have been king before him. So with the ascension of Louis XVIII to the throne of France, you might be forgiven to for thinking, what was the point? What was the point of the French Revolution? If we started with a king, we ended with a king, did anything actually happen? Well, the truth is, is the French Revolution was absolutely transformative. Um, uh, because Napoleon had conquered most of Europe, the ideas had spread. Uh, of the revolution it spread far beyond French's, uh, France's borders. Really, the French Revolution ended the concept of absolutism forever in France, but also monarchies everywhere in Europe were forced to change. None of them would be able to rule with the same carte blanche power that absolute monarchs had enjoyed in the past. It also demonstrated that Enlightenment ideas were serious political forces. Two major rebellions had rocked the Western world, the American Revolution and then the French Revolution, and both of those were uh, born out of Enlightenment ideas. The other major shift was this concept of nationalism. French troops during the war had fought as citizens. The French government had governed on behalf of citizens. Constitutions in the United States and in uh, France recognized that people were equal under the law and that they uh, had both rights and responsibilities under the law as citizens. Suddenly now, people were no longer subjects, they were citizens. This is the birth of nationalism, and this is an infection. It will spread everywhere, not just in Europe, but over the entire world and will transform the way the world thinks of itself. And finally, the revolution will also inspire like-minded revolutions elsewhere amongst France's colonies. So for example, Haiti was a French uh, slave colony that uh, rebelled against France shortly after the beginning of the revolution and uh, several other um, uh, colonies in the Caribbean and Latin America also rebelled against their colonial masters, again based on the same enlightened ideas that had originally sparked the American Revolution and the French Revolution. So pretty important. <laughs>